that's what we want. That is our historic living floor. Something's going on here, something really interesting. Oh! oh. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Do these Maryland suburbs hide the story of a slave who inspired the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin? There could have been a building here that Josiah Henson walked in. He was a remarkable man. Our job is to emancipate Josiah Henson one more time. Joe Watkins, Alan Macca, Meg Waters, Chelsea Rose, Jeff Brown, and me, Justine Shapiro. Together, we are Time Team America. For three days, we bring together the top scientists with the newest technologies to help solve America's greatest archaeological mysteries. This program was made possible in part by a major grant from the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. Just 20 miles from our nation's capital stand the remains of an old slave plantation. Most of its 270 acres are buried beneath the lawns of a fashionable D.C. suburb. And buried with it is the story of a slave who escaped to freedom to become one of the most influential men in United States history. His name is Josiah Henson. After he escaped in Canada, Josiah helped found a town for other escaped slaves and he risked his life to help others escape. But his most powerful weapon was his autobiography, which inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe as she wrote her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her novel enraged slaveholders in the South and energized abolitionists in the North. Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel became one of the most important books in American history. Its power turned millions against slavery and helped launch the Civil War. But who is Josiah Henson? the man Stowe turned into Uncle Tom, the character at the heart of her novel. Can Time Team find evidence of his time here beneath these yards or under this old cabin? Today, all that remains of Isaac Riley's plantation are his house, this cabin, and an acre and a half of land, now protected by Montgomery County as Josiah Henson Special Park. <laughs> Time Team brings its technology, expertise, and muscle to dig into this Maryland plantation and the life of Josiah Henson. Let's get shovels up. Ooh, it's muddy. But are the three days our resources give us to work here enough time to find evidence of Henson's life? Let's dig it. We join forces with archaeologists from Montgomery County Parks and get started looking for the slave quarters. Okay, so the plan this morning is to open up a two and a half foot by 40 foot trench along this perimeter to try to see, is there a structure here? Maybe a wall that mm -hmm. fell. 0 0.2. Meanwhile, some of the neighbors start wondering what history might be hiding in their backyards. So my house sits just right in there. So we think that's another structure right here. Since Riley's plantation covered most of the neighborhood, this is a great opportunity to expand our search. Josiah Henson was enslaved for nearly 40 years. For more than a decade before his escape to Canada, he was Isaac Riley's farm overseer. After his escape to Canada, he produced his autobiography with a ghostwriter to give a true account of a life lived in slavery. Published in 1849, it became a bestseller, and Harriet Beecher Stowe read it soon after. But how important was Uncle Tom's Cabin to fueling the abolitionist movement? It was an extremely important book. And it went uh, around the world. It was translated in numerous languages. So it was the expose right. 
She was like the Zola or Dickens of, of her time, yes. right? Writing she, about how real people live. Yes, it brought to the fore what is going on inside of slavery, the cruelty. Stowe's book was viciously attacked by supporters of slavery. They said her humane portrayal of the enslaved was naive and dangerous. And they charged that her enslaved character, Uncle Tom, kind, generous, and patient, could never be a real man. Stowe answered her critics by writing another book, a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And this is where she directly ties Uncle Tom's Cabin to Josiah Henson. And she says a parallel with that of Uncle Tom is to be found in the published memoirs of the venerable Josiah Henson. But, Cheryl says, Stowe's fictional Tom only captures a small part of Henson. So it's not Josiah Henson we remember, but Stowe's caricature of him, a kowtowing black man known since the 1960s and the civil rights movement as Uncle Tom. She's taken the character of Henson, but she hasn't taken his strength. Uh -huh. So we have this image of this long-suffering, gentle, Christian, all-abiding man. And we know that the real man here contemplates murder to escape. He escapes from slavery with his wife and with four children, two of whom are too young to walk, and he carries them on his back. Yeah. It speaks to the strength of character. He did not leave them behind. We're never going to rehabilitate the term Uncle Tom. That's right. in the lexicon. That's here to stay. Back in the 60s, even uh, among American Indians, those people who worked within the system and really didn't pull their compadres out of it were called Uncle Tomahawks. Oh, really? Uh huh. I didn't know that. And, and so it was a play on the word, but you can see how it has become a rallying cry, especially for the civil rights movement. Our job is to actually emancipate Josiah Henson one more time. But what kind of evidence did slavery leave here? Unlike their masters, the enslaved had almost nothing to leave behind. And Henson lived on this plantation from the 1790s to the mid-1820s, nearly 200 years ago, on a radically different landscape. You can see the swimming pool next door is right there in the aerial photograph. But we've got a remarkable clue. An aerial photograph of the Riley property from 1927. These farm buildings, which are no longer here, date from the 19th century. This is a landscape that Henson might recognize. So while it's 1927 and not the 1800s, right. you know, we still can use that information because the land was used as a farm continuously. Meg and her crew, Brian and Duncan, have already added to this clue with magnetometry, one of their geophys techniques. Magnetometry measures the contrast of different magnetic field strengths of objects beneath the ground. Objects like burned clay and bricks and things made out of iron like nails and horseshoes produce strong magnetic fields. This is magnetic data. We're looking at ferrous things. In this case, I think a ton of nails. Wow. Okay? There's a mass of iron in here and some very strong magnetic signatures. Well, you know, we know that Isaac Riley was a blacksmith. Uh-huh. So this, you know, maybe this was where his workshop could have been. If this is the blacksmith shop, it might help us find other buildings on the plantation. But Meg's anomaly is two backyards over, and while the neighbors have invited us to collect geophys, they haven't given us permission to excavate. Do they know what's in their backyard? Well, I don't, you know, I think, I think it's a good time to uh, talk to the neighbors. Talk, talk to, to the neighbors. Yeah. I think our options for finding good garbage deposits are going to be either right in here or right in here. So let's go right up slope mm -hmm. with some kind of trench. Alan goes after what could be a treasure trove of artifacts, a trash pit. He thinks it may hide artifacts we can tie to Henson and the other enslaved people who lived here. I love cooking wares and storage vessels, evidence from food preparation and eating. And you can start to pick out the differences in what, say, the white slave owners would have been 
eating and using in terms of crockery and things like this and what the slaves would have had access to. That's fascinating to me. But our biggest lead might be this cabin. It was built in 1850 as a kitchen. While that was long after Henson escaped to Canada in 1830, it could still be hiding evidence of his time here before that. We're hoping that maybe this kitchen was built on an earlier kitchen that was here when Josiah Henson was here. In his autobiography, Josiah writes of being forced to sleep on the kitchen's dirt floor. Are we standing over that old floor now? Okay, so this floor wasn't here as part of this kitchen. No, no, it was a dirt floor even in 1850. So we're going to be ripping this out carefully, then we're going to look at what we have and get a picture of what's underneath here. That's correct. As we get started, Chelsea is working in the large trench looking for the slave quarters, Alan is looking for a trash pit behind the garage, and tomorrow afternoon we'll pull up the cabin floor. But right now, Meg can't wait to show us the hot spot she found in her magnetometry. So here we are, just coming up. The road's picking up just here. Now we're in the neighbor's yard, right? We're in yes. the, the final neighbor's yard. The road is coming right up here. Yeah. We follow the old farm road from the 1927 photograph. Right here, we have three, maybe four structures which would be in where? the aerial photo, which would be starting over here. Uh -huh. And what we saw in the magnetic data was pretty phenomenal. If you want to hold this map. Sure. In the magnetic data, we have one wall right here. Uh -huh. We have a second wall coming right along here. The structure Meg sees on the magnetometry overlaps this structure in the photo almost perfectly. And right in the middle, at the top here to the north, is a really large anomaly. Something's going on here, something really interesting. It makes sense that the blacksmith shop would be near the barns. And that's a very important industry if you are working a farm right. or a plantation. You need metal implements. You need your horseshoes. Right. You need all of these things that a blacksmith is going to produce. Right. So it would be terrific if we actually find evidence that that's what's here. The blacksmith shop ties us directly to Henson's story. In 1794, when Josiah was four years old, his family was separated and sold. Riley bought his mother, but Josiah, who she begged Riley to buy too, was sold to a tavern keeper named Rob. When Josiah fell ill, Rob offered to sell him to Riley. Josiah writes in his autobiography that Riley agreed to pay a small sum for me in horseshoeing if I lived, and nothing if I died. That clenched the bargain, and I was soon sent to my mother. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, and how many, how many hours a day would people do this oh, sort of work? Whoa. About 10 or 12 hours a day. Good Lord. Whoa. To get a sense of what plantation life was like for Henson growing up, we take a trip back in time to Button Farm, about 30 miles from the Riley Plantation. Let it down. Oh, oh my goodness, I kind of lost my way there a little bit. I'm going back to the tractor. <laughs> Two hundred years ago, this was a farm on the scale of Isaac Riley's, about 300 acres with 15 slaves. Today, Button Farm is a living history center. It was conceived of by historian Tony Cohen. Tony shows us some tools Josiah would have known or used. You've heard the term uh, keeping all your irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. Well, that relates to a flat iron. If you were a laundress on the plantation, your job was to iron clothes all day. You would have to heat these things up. It takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes to get it at full heat, but uh, less than half that time for it to cool down. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's so heavy. Yeah. 
Now I do have something here that Josiah would have used. I like this because it's a good illustration of maybe a child's first experience in slavery. This is a yoke and it was used for carrying buckets of water. This is a first for me. I'm gonna try it with some buckets. Okay. And you're gonna lift from right here and here. Okay. Lift up. Oh, really heavy. Oh. That and is now what, you're there. <laughs> yeah. In Josiah's time. I just wanted to see if I could walk a little more with this. I can't quite get the balance right. Oh. It's hard to walk steady. Oh my goodness. As a person carrying this yoke, uh, I would uh, look around and see animals wearing the same implement. That's essentially what you would have been considered at the time, a draft animal. Back on the Riley plantation, Allen's trash pit is slow going. In the lower area, a lot of uh, window glass. Our screeners are well aware there's a lot of glass, so you gotta be careful. This thick layer of 1950s trash is probably from the construction of the garage. But as the day winds down, we're moving back in time and closer to Josiah Henson. Just found this piece of ceramic. It's a red-bodied earthenware oh, yeah? with a black glazing on it. Oh, look at it that. may be earlier than the other stuff we've been finding in this area. Maybe 150 years earlier than that. Could the... be much older. Talking mid 19th century, probably. That's great. That's a good sign. I got it. The largest artifact on the site is easily the Riley House itself. The people who were enslaved here would have called it the Big House. This was the heart of the plantation. Yes, so come on in. So this is it. This is. Isaac Riley's home. Yeah, this is it. And one of the things that people find so surprising is that it's so modestly scaled. But he was a typical mm -hmm. middle class planter in Montgomery County. And how much of this is original? Actually, the bones of this house are all original. And that's what's exciting for us as architectural historians and preservationists. So this beam up here, um, you can see it was hewn by an ads. That's original. Also, this trim is from the 1820s or 30s. Again, this would have been to Henson's time yes, period. Yes. On the surface, it looks like any 1930s house. Yeah. Why is that? This house was heavily renovated between 1936 and 1939. So was this always one big room? No, actually, this summer beam uh -huh. would have very likely had a partition. This room was called the hall. Riley Family Records describe some of its furnishings. It was both the dining room and a work area. Josiah, as overseer, probably knew this room well, conducting business here with Isaac Riley. Yes, this is the family's the private rooms house. were upstairs. So this is one of the original chambers or bedrooms of the house. Uh -huh. This may even be Isaac and Matilda Riley's bedroom, the master bedroom. Insurance records tell us the Riley's bedroom was comfortably furnished, of four fireplaces, this was the only one upstairs. Did they have a skylight? <laughs> Good question. Up in here are the original trusses, and we extracted some nails. There's something really cool about these nails. This helped us date the house. Mm -hmm. So it's a hand-wrought square-cut nail, the teardrop point. What's teardrop? This end, the end part of the nail? Yeah. Uh huh. In Maryland, those stopped being made in 1815. Oh. So by that nail, we know that this house was built between about 1800 and 1815. Oh. While the big house still stands, the slave quarters have vanished from the landscape. But Chelsea's still excited by what we're finding. What we found was a layer of compacted soil. And we know here on the Riley Plantation that a lot of the dwellings here had earthen floors. And what an earthen floor looks like archaeologically is compacted earth. So compacted earth means, earthen floor means there may have been a structure here. Could be, but okay. in any case, it's a feature. And we've got artifacts in here too. And anytime we can link them with a feature, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Because then it's not just random stuff anymore. So look what we've got to go along with the floor. 
These are probably rot nails. It's hard to say because they're very corroded, but they're pretty robust and they look like some of the earliest nails. Joey showed us nails that they found up in the mm -hmm. original house. And we're also finding domestic artifacts out here. It's a bottle. This is bottle glass. And then this piece Flo of ceramic. Blue. What is flow blue? It's a transfer print, but it's made to bleed when it is fired and it makes this sort of attractive design. It dates to uh, about between 1830 and 1860. Okay, a dirt floor, nails, and a dinner plate that dates back to slavery. This combination of artifacts could mean a living space. Henson describes the building we're looking for. We lodged in log huts and on the bare ground. Wooden floors were an unknown luxury. Our beds were collections of straw and rags. Here were the children born and the sick neglected. Have we found the slave quarters? Well, we don't know yet, but we're off to a good start. The time period seems right. So that's exciting. That's a good place to be at the end of day one. But before the day is over, we have one last question. Can we convince Paula and her husband to let us excavate Meg's anomaly in their backyard? We'll find out tomorrow. Hey, are we ready up there? Watch your fingers. Watch your fingers. Okay, that'll work. Let's go and move this up the hill. Day two, and it doesn't look good. But if the rain holds off, we can take advantage of some great news. Paula says we can dig. I'm so curious to see what we're going to find in the neighbor's backyard. Do you think we'll know something by the end of the day today about what's back there? I, I think we'll have a very good indication of what we we're going to We spent a be. good long time last night till going till, over the geofiz. Yeah, going over the geofiz, coming up with a plan. And I'm confident it's going to, you know, it's a blue sky. Good, it's going to appear, going to dry out here. Three meters up and one and a half out. Meg is already at work in Paula's yard, plotting three units over what we hope is Isaac Riley's blacksmith shop. We've got this red square here, and we're gonna put this corner right here, right down here under my feet, accurately, of course. And this is gonna go back one, a little berm, two. Since we're only allowed to dig a small area, we'll separate each unit by a foot of untouched earth to cover more ground. Over at Allen's trash pit, it's still a slog. We're finding mostly garbage from uh, probably about 50, 60 years ago. Tons of glass bottles. So this is off the back side of the house, down a slope. They dumped stuff here 50 years ago. Yeah. Probably dumped stuff here 150 years ago. Oh, this is nice. Check this out. The medicine bottle. No seam. No seam. No That's good. No seam in the glass means it goes back at least to the 19th century. That's good. Probably a medicine bottle, 19th century, 1800s. The garbage is getting better. Our best chance of finding a direct connection to Josiah could be beneath this old kitchen. It's the most intimate artifact of slave life still standing on the Riley plantation and an important piece of history. Who constructed it? Matilda Riley added it to the house probably just after Isaac Riley passed away in 1850. Okay. She writes about it in her insurance application of 1856, my attached log kitchen. What's really interesting is enslaved people would have occupied this space, worked in this space, the cook, the cook's family. I can show you some things in the back too that's okay. really interesting. If you look right here, yeah. you can see this clean, Line. Oh, yeah, this, this was a door? That's right, yeah. this was a door. Yeah, you can see that. Mm -hmm. So this was the back door to the kitchen, so the field slaves out doing labor would come into the back of the kitchen. They wouldn't have to go through the house. And what we know about this building also is right here, you can see these are pockets, okay, that have been filled in here and here. And these would have supported joists. These joists would have run that way and supported a loft. And that's where enslaved people, probably the cook and her family, slept above in a loft. They would have slept on rags, in straw, maybe with a plank of wood, no real beds. If this kitchen was built over an older kitchen, Josiah could have known this spot well. One of the most remarkable scenes in Josiah Henson's life is when Isaac Riley here entrusts 
Henson to take the 20 or so people who would have been enslaved here on this site to his brother's plantation in Kentucky. Because of legal problems, Isaac Riley fears he'll lose his slaves, some of his most valuable property. To hide them, he orders Henson to take them 700 miles to Kentucky. There, Josiah and they will become the slaves of Riley's brother, Amos. And when he gets to Cincinnati, which is a place where free blacks are very empowered, they say to Henson, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. you, you have the capacity to free these people, let them go. And Henson says, no, mm -hmm. I am a, you know, I'm a trustworthy man, I am loyal. I'm a man of my word. I'm a man of my word. Here in his autobiography, he says, a feeling of integrity, the sentiment of high honor, I thus gained by obedience to what I believed right are advantages which I prize. Before God, I tried to do my best, and the error of judgment lies at the door of the degrading system under which I had been nurtured. Mm -hmm. So he critiques the system as well as himself to say that this is the person that I have become and not emancipating the people when they, he had the opportunity in Cincinnati. A year later, Amos sells these same men and women down the river to a plantation in Mississippi. And soon after that, Josiah sees their fate for himself. Although he is very loyal, he's also extremely valuable and valued right. from an economic perspective. Amos Riley contrives a plan to send Josiah Henson to New Orleans to sell him there. On the way, Henson asked to stop at Vicksburg to see the people Amos Riley sold. And he's given that permission. And he says, it was the saddest visit I ever made. Four years in an unhealthy climate and under a hard master had done the ordinary work of 20. Their cheeks were literally caved in with starvation and disease. I went away sick at heart, and to this day, the remembrance of that wretched group haunts me. He got to see the consequences of his actions. I think he thought he was above having these kinds of things happen to him. And when he stares at what it means to be sold into the Deep South, what it means for his family, then we start to see the man transform. Hey, Michael. Hey. When Alan hears there's a special meal planned for this evening, he tracks down the chef, culinary historian Michael Twitty. This is what enslaved people would have eaten, but I want you to keep in mind that Fresh meat was so rare that it was a treat like candy. OK. And this is salt herring right here. Yes. Right. So this salt herring would have been every day god awful. We don't have a lot of protein on the table to begin with gotcha. because it's primarily a veggie-vore diet. Michael says the enslaved people grew their own produce in their own gardens or truck patches. And it basically was a way for slaveholders to kind of say, here, I'm giving you something. Right. But in reality, what they were doing was freeing themselves up from, from paying for more food. It looks totally amazing. What do we got? Broiled chicken, because Josiah Henson talked about how they used to have fun broiling stray chickens uh -huh. here on the Raleigh plantation. Henson wrote that to make sure his fellow slaves got enough to eat, Riley's pigs and chickens would sometimes go missing. We have okra soup. It's a dish that includes all the stuff that would have been found in the truck patch. Okra, tomatoes, onion, squash. But is there pork in there? Oh, yeah. But pork not, in everything. But that's going to be the salt pork. So it's seasoning, Yes, yeah, seasoning. Right. It's not an entree, it's a seasoning. And then this is the, uh, what do you call it, the green corn? The Green uh, corn, roasting ears. That's what you would have this time of year, and the rest of the corn would be let grow to make um, field corn. When do you think we're going to eat? Um, if, uh... <laughs> whenever it's done. Whenever it's done. Over in Paula's yard, we don't have the blacksmith shop yet, but we're finding a curious mix of artifacts. What is that sticking out? Uh, part of a plate. It's mm -hmm. like late 19th century, okay. early 20th century. Okay. While these domestic artifacts date from after Henson, the geofiz was spot on. Well, Meg thought we had a structure here, and we're finding a lot of what look like rot nails. Oh, okay. Well, they're pretty corroded, but they do look like they were rot. So the nails are early 19th century mm -hmm. Josiah Henson. 
Could be, yeah, Could they're be. consistent with. Okay. It's probably the same building we saw in the photos, and that probably dates to the time when the plantation was active. So that's encouraging. Now we just have to figure out what exactly it was. In 1828, Josiah convinces Amos Riley to give him a slave pass so he can go back to Maryland to visit his old master, Isaac. Traveling across Ohio, Henson experiences freedom for the first time. Along the way, he starts preaching and earns money for his real plan to buy his freedom. But when he gets to Maryland, wearing new clothes and riding a horse, Isaac is stunned to see him looking like a gentleman. Henson writes that Riley makes him sleep on the floor of the old kitchen. That crowded room with its earth floor, its filth and stench, I kept awake thinking how I could escape from that accursed spot. He chose to be honest, pay for his freedom, and leave slavery that way. This is his manumission record. This is the paper that sets him free. Mm -hmm. Manumission meaning that I have bought my freedom. I've bargained. We've set a price, and this is what we've decided. And Isaac Riley says, in consideration of the money that has been paid to me, that I released from slavery, liberate, manumitted, and set free mm -hmm. my Negro man named Josiah, Josiah Henson. Henson forever. Sign Isaac Riley. Sign Isaac Riley. Yep. This is the most precious document that someone who's held in slavery can actually have. Is this also the first time that we actually see Josiah Henson's name in documents? I believe it is. Wow. But it's amazing that even though we have the manumission document here and he paid a sum of money and Isaac Riley signed it, yes. he actually never used this yes. to gain freedom. Yes. He, he, he never used it. When Josiah returns to Kentucky and his family, he discovers that the Riley brothers have cheated him, secretly raising his price to an amount he can never pay. Can you imagine how cruel that is? Can you imagine you have worked, you think you're going to be released from slavery? But when, when the man realizes what the situation actually is, he takes matters into his own yeah. hands. One of the most important aspects of Henson's story was escape. He escaped with his whole entire family, didn't he? He did. He did, which is something that was very rare. Women scarcely went out on the Underground Railroad because they were staying behind with their children. It was men in their middle 20s who escaped the most. They had the most mobility. They were also really valuable in a monetary sense, weren't they? What was the value, for example, of a strapping 20-year-old, 200-pound enslaved person? In the early years of slavery in Maryland, slaves were actually assessed at $5 a pound. $5 a pound. So a 200 pounds? $1,000. $1,000. And how much would this house have been worth? You could get, in Montgomery County, a couple of acres, a small barn, a house, and maybe even uh, crops and cattle for $1,000. Josiah writes of a typical night on the run. All night long, the children cried with hunger, and my poor wife loaded me with reproaches for bringing them into such misery. A fearful dread of detection ever pursued me. So what happened if someone got caught? Well, your hand's actually on it. What, his ship's anchor? Yes, exactly. If you got caught, you were certainly going down. This is a replica of a slave collar. Oh. Now this was used most often to punish people who had attempted to escape. This was actually put around someone's neck. I'd love it if I could demonstrate on you. Sure. Turn around. There you go. Put your finger over your Adam's apple. And now I'm going to close this, trying not to, to pinch you. And back in the day, this would have been welded on. Ooh. Welded on, so I mean, how would they ever take it off? A blacksmith would have needed to put it on and take it off. How yeah. does that feel, Joe? Oppressive. It's <clears throat> the very cold steel against your neck is just, it's a constant. 
and it's very It's a heavy. reminder, yeah. It's got prongs on the end that will latch on to vines or branches if you should attempt to run to the woods. And if I were running in fell? You would be probably dead. Mm. Yep, instantly break your neck. And in fact, we should take it off of you now. You look very burdened, Joe. You look sad. It's, it's dehumanizing. I think we say that a lot, but it's very, very emotional. Back on the Riley Plantation, we want to pull up the kitchen floor before the day ends. Wow, it's a lot oh, more wow. open now. <laughs> now that is not old. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's definitely not old. That's, that's 20, 30 years old at the most. Uh -huh. of that type of timber, so. So somebody's been in here under this flooring at some point. Yeah, right. we, yeah. we had Put that, that 1935 floor, subfloor. This looks like 1970s, but look at the but, dirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're getting through the dirt. The dirt <laughs> we want. And really the important thing is that this might give us a glimpse back to some of that history, we hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. <laughs> As day two winds down and we get ready for dinner, we're joined by the Jubilee Voices. While Josiah wrote about the rare joy of a special meal, there was always music for celebration, for work, and for survival. Imagine being somewhere where somebody has taken just about everything away from you, your freedom, you can't read, you can't write, you're a stranger in a strange land. What we had was our music. So the songs became a way to communicate, and one of those songs, Steal Away, most people thought that was about death. As we know during the Underground Railroad time, that was used to tell people it's time to escape. So the spirituals, they're not just holy songs, they were part of our oral tradition, part of our history. in it. <laughs> I see nice time. Place. Did you get chicken? We're joined at the table by a special guest. Teamwork. Josiah's descendant, James Henson. Oh, you're carving it. Good. Squash, onion. You gonna bless the table there? Okay. <laughs> bless us, O oh Lord, and these that gifts which we're about to receive. Amen. Delicious. I'm liking the bread. I've always feel good about when people eat my food and they like it. That's the good part. <laughs> plantation but we want to see the whole world that Josiah Henson knew and to do that we're gonna get a bird's-eye view Henson was responsible for raising and selling Riley's crops, wheat, oats, corn, barley, and more. He wrote, my pride and ambition made me master of all kinds of farm work. To sell Riley's crops, he was sent on his own to the markets in Georgetown and Washington, D.C. There, always alert, he learned more than just business skills. I came in contact with many of the most intelligent gentlemen in Washington, and when they conversed, I listened attentively and remembered their phrases and sentences, and in this way, I learned to speak more correctly. So he's really coming in contact with a lot of powerful people, but he sees the life of freedom as well as the life of slavery. 
Josiah began to master a world that few slaves were allowed to see. There's only one day left, and we've got a lot to do. We're still looking for slave quarters. Alan is still working in the trash pit. We're still working in Paula's yard, going for the blacksmith shop. And Joe is in the cabin, looking for an older kitchen. After we scrape through the first layer of dirt, we find a thin concrete floor that probably dates to the early 20th century. But then, Joe finds something else. Hey, Justine. Yeah, yeah, I hear you guys found something exciting, huh? Yes, we did. You remember the other day at Button Farm, we were talking about the irons and all the irons in the fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we just oh, wow. got all the loose dirt off down to a concrete floor here. This is what we came up with. Can I hold it? Oh, yes, please. So what period does this date back to, do you think, Joe? This can be anywhere from 1820s up to 1880s to uh -huh. early 1900s. It makes sense that it would be so close to the fire, doesn't it? Right. And the way this is corroded, it's left us a shadow on this very thin concrete floor uh -huh. that was put down. This is good, but to get to Josiah's time, we have to get past this concrete. Over in Paula's yard, James Henson, Josiah's great, great, great nephew, lends a hand. This is OJT, as we used to say in the military. <laughs> What's OJT? <laughs> On the job training. <laughs> you don't go to tech school, you, you just get instructed to do That's this. Right. That's right. James says that Josiah drew his strength from his religious faith and was a preacher throughout his adult life. I think Josiah would say we all have a duty we have a duty, and in his case, it was to Christ. That was his standard, because he was very um, taken in, very moved by what he heard about Jesus when he heard his first sermon, right. not too far from here, about three or four miles uh, from here. Josiah's mother convinced him to attend his first prayer meeting at Newport Mills when he was 18. They would not let niggers into the meeting. I went all around the house, and at last I got in front of the door. And the preacher said, Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, for the rich, for the poor, the free, the Negro in his chains. And I cried out, I wonder if Jesus Christ died for me. James says Josiah's faith continued to guide him in Canada, where he co-founded a town for other escaped slaves called Dawn. They bought the land, they educated the children, so they in turn could be teachers. And that was one of the most successful, if not the most successful, all-black settlement in Canada. But think about it. He left Canada where he was free, That's right. came back to Kentucky and Maryland and freed slaves on the Underground Railroad. You have to conclude that he was a remarkable man. Mm -hmm. oh! 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 Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Ooh, that is beautiful. <laughs> so I know you want to grab it, but we have to slowly expose no, I'm, it. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm deferring to, to the lady with the skilled hands. <laughs> it's not old enough. <laughs> Keep digging. <laughs> As our work shifts to the cabin, we close the trenches where we were looking for the slave quarters. While our finds here still suggest a living space, we'll need more evidence before we can say these were the slave quarters. We're closing the units in Paula's yard, too. What's the latest on the interpretation of these features? Well, it's interesting. We seem to have three parallel features running in these units. This one looks like it's a burn beam here. You can actually see there's some burning here. And this is the, this is probably a burn plank, and it had iron uh, cut and wrought nails in this plank. These other two, these have an artifact concentration uh, dating late 19th, early 20th, mid 20th century. To me, what's really the take home message is 
you know, some of the stuff's not old, but it looks like the building is. It We've does got seem the rot right. nails. The structural materials are the right time period. So while we can't say Riley's blacksmith shop stood here, the evidence is good that a building here did date to Josiah Henson. 2.65. In the kitchen, we're pushing hard. We're through the concrete and troweling past a layer of soft soil. We hope on our way to the 1850s floor. This will be a compact surface buried beneath looser soil, and if there's an older floor, it will be below that. Each dirt floor acts as a time capsule, sealing history and archaeology beneath it. After some more digging, we find something. Yeah. What I've come down to is a much harder surface, uh -huh. and in that surface there's embedded charcoal. Yeah, that's so I think that's want. a definite different mm -hmm. layer. That's what we want. <laughs> that's pretty intact. Wow. So is your assumption that this earthen floor dates to 1850 when the building was constructed that Matilda uh, Riley writes about? This is the floor. There's charcoal. There's, there's darker soils. This is where somebody was living, walking, stuff's dropping, they're okay. sweeping, there's ashes. You know, this is our living surface. But if Josiah's floor is here and we want to find it, we've got to keep digging. Over at the trash pit, Alan's team is done now too. This is a piece of English-made refined white earthenware decorated with a printed underglaze designed in light blue. Those light blue designs were very popular between 1830 and 1850, and I believe that these two pieces mm -hmm. meant. So if this is 1830, 1850, mm -hmm. we're getting 1830, the time in which Josiah Henson went to Canada, and mm -hmm. 1850 right. is pretty much about the time when Isaac Riley, the, the, the owner of the plantation, died. Right. So this piece arguably dates to their, their, their life. That's exactly That's right. Awesome. And I think it was a wash basin. Uh, this looks like a plate also made in England. Um, the dark brown design on the sort of more ivory colored body mm -hmm. lets me know that it was probably made in the 1870s to 1880s. And then what about this big jug fragment? It's a rim with a <laughs> handle. It's a North American salt glaze stoneware crock and this is the rim here. Would have been used for storing flour or making pickles or, you know, storing quantities of food. Patricia says these pieces represent a good range of objects from everyday life on a plantation. But whose objects were they? What would the white people have used for serving and cooking and eating mm -hmm. and versus uh, the enslaved people? Things were being handed down by the plantation owners to the slaves. The, yeah. the plate is chipped. Right. They're or not going to use it. But right. when it goes to the slave. Yellowish red. No, it might have looked like a floor Finding Josiah's floor is now our final goal. And while we're not below the 1850 floor yet, Chelsea is finding artifacts. Already we're finding a lot of stuff, and some of it's exciting. This is a glass marble. We also found a clay marble. Outside, you found the No, clay we found one in oh, here as well. Oh, yeah. Like the one you found uh -huh. outside? Oh, wow. Yeah. It's Can you tell what this is? Yes, it's the end of a pipe. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's still not old enough, but if you look closely, you can actually see teeth marks on there. Oh, those are teeth marks. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yes. Talk about a personal connection. A personal you know? connection. There's no air conditioning in here, but we've got to keep digging. We've only got a couple of hours left. What do you have? Oh. 1820 ceramic. It's a piece of transfer printed, um, probably pearlware from the 1820s, English earthenware. It may be a small fragment, but it would have come from a beautiful dish like this. And a dish this old is a very good sign. But we're almost out of time. And then... Oh, yeah! So, Joe, do you see that? I do. We're there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's incredible. It may only look like a hole in the dirt, 
but it's so much more. We looked at the 1930s floor. We came back in. We have the concrete floor. Right. We have the floor that we interpreted originally as 1850s. And then we get to the third floor. <laughs> So, I mean, at this point, I'm starting to feel comfortable saying that there could have been a building here that Josiah Henson walked in. Yeah, he could I, have stood right here. I agree with you. Down at this level, he could have walked right in this spot. I didn't think I'd get to this point. I mean, people have been asking me, oh, did Josiah Henson touch this cup? Did he drink out of the cup? <laughs> right. No. But, I mean, I'm there, you know? After we leave, Montgomery County Parks archaeologists and historians will continue their research into the Riley Plantation and the life of Josiah Henson. So what do you guys think? This is a public park. Yes. This is somewhere people can come and they are going to try to figure out strategies to interpret this and share this and educate the public. They're only going to learn more about this and this is something that people will be able to come and see. And to me, that's really exciting. Harry Peter Stowe wrote one of the most, probably the most incredible novel in the history of America for what it served. But Josiah Henson, he was the message. That was the message. And if you read the first hundred pages even of that book, you see that she borrowed directly and, 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 and copiously mm -hmm. from his work. And he changed the world. Mm -hmm. and, and we're here and identifying, mm -hmm. you know, where he, where, he, where he walked, where he might have slept. This structure, to me, epitomizes that big interplay between the, the slaver and the enslaved person. There were probably moments of joyful song and family and running and laughing, laughter here that may not have been heard anywhere else on this plantation. Yeah. And that to me is what has made this whole thing worthwhile. I'm leaving here feeling that this person has changed my perspective, and to me, that has been a life-changing moment. Yeah. The 1828 kitchen Josiah slept in would have had just a few pieces of furniture and enough cookware to prepare meals for the Riley family. But this was a home, too. And while it stands right next door to the big house, it stands in a world of its own. Next time on Time Team America, the bones of Badger Hole. This is a kneecap, part of the palm. This is great stuff. More than 10,000 years ago, these animals were massive, much bigger than the ones we see now. Shot! Shot! This is the bottom of the ancient gully. We see impact fractures on the bones. And there you go. There you go. Beautiful. This program was made possible in part by A major grant from the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. Learn more on the web at pbs.org slash timeteamamerica where you'll find an in-depth look at the science and technologies we use, web-exclusive videos of the team, and highlights from our archaeology field school for you. This season of Time Team America is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. just finished watching Time Team America, a TV show about archaeology right here in the USA. The Time Team is more than just a TV series. It's also a field school for middle and high school students. While we're shooting our TV show, our field school students are right here with us. 
They spend the week with our experts, digging up artifacts, getting their hands dirty, and living this adventure we call science. You can see our field school in action at pbs.org slash Time Team America.